Hey everyone, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. For a moment, I was afraid there was no one in the room. <laughs> uh, I'm Larry Mado. I am an international correspondent at CNN. It's such a pleasure to be here to lead this panel on advancing racial and ethnic equity. And I'm really excited to have my esteemed panel joining me from the extreme left. Ms. Angela F. Williams, President and CEO of United Way Worldwide. Please give a big round of applause. Woo. Very enthusiastic, I love that. Mr. Simon Freakley, CEO of Alex Partners. <laughs> Ms. Pamela L. Carter, member of the board of directors of Hewlett Pocket Enterprise. <laughs> and my fellow young global leader, Ms. Luana de Souza Martins Genot, executive director of the Brazilian Identities Institute. I'm so glad we're having this conversation, literally just a few days after the birthday of Martin Luther King Jr., who was a civil rights icon. And when this initiative came up from the World Economic Forum, it came out of a, a place of hurt and pain. And I, in 2020, when George Floyd was murdered, I was covering North America for the BBC, and I've interviewed the Floyd family and covered the trial of Derek Chauvin, literally every word that was said in the courtroom. And I think one of the beautiful things that came out of that experience was the diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives from organizations globally that have set to find a standard to make sure that their workplaces, their organizations are more inclusive. But there's a long way to go, and we can all agree on that, right? There's still a lot more that needs to be done to make sure there's a way to track that, and there's a way that companies are doing better, organizations from every corner of the world. And so I'm glad on this panel we've got representation from Latin America, from the US, from Europe, and we can have a real honest conversation about this. And I just want to mention a quick plug here. That this panel builds on the work that the World Economic Forum is already doing. Um, and they're working towards better accountability to gain greater clarity on the current gaps at organizational level. And so the World Economic Forum has an initiative called Partnering for Racial Justice in Business. And this week, just two days ago, they launched a report. It's called Global Racial and Ethnic Equity Self-Assessment Framework. They launched a framework that you can download now for your own organization. The QR code is back there. It's up on the screen. So please feel free to do that because it's useful to frame this conversation, but also to bring back to your own organizations. But I want to go straight into it and begin with where do you see the biggest challenges currently for advancing racial and ethnic equity? And where is also the progress, right? I don't want to just talk about the negative bits, but there has to be some positivity in this as well. So the advantages or disadvantages, the progress, the weaknesses, Luana, I'm going to start with you. Oh, thank you. So, yeah, I'm Luana Genoa. I come from Brazil, from Rio de Janeiro, and we work with uh, basically inclusion in the labor market, especially with data, policy making, and, you know, providing tools and education for companies, especially for decision makers, uh, white decision makers mostly, to actually be more intentional on hiring decisions, but in a holistic view as well. So I brought like six points, but I'll be really quick to go through context on things or we are moving forward or not. First of all, you're mentioning like a George Floyd situation. In Brazil, we kill a George Floyd like every 23 minutes. So that's our reality. George Floyd's uh, end, uh, ended up to be a broadcasted case, but that case happens like in a daily basis. So we need to think more about that. But we are, we are going through now a plateau from our experiences. So uh, it means that we had a lot of companies who engaged with pledges around the world, but now they're not pledging anymore, or they are somehow stuck in, in you know, the challenges they, want, they, they are facing, or even the, the, the good things they, they have been doing. I mean, the pledges were good, good measures, but now we need to move forward. Second thing, in Brazil right now, we changed our government. Now it's a more progressive government. But it doesn't mean necessarily that we will have like racial equity right away. Right. So we need to have civil society companies and governments be, to be intentional about it. Otherwise, it doesn't move forward automatically. Uh, third, I would say like keep up. We have we still are facing difficulty to keep up the pace. I think like what we we've, we've experienced from George Floyd's uh, you know situation, murdered uh, the, the crime we we saw and we, what what we see now. Uh, 
um, is that we actually advanced a lot in this, those past two years, but now we need to keep up the pace. Then is it because the matter is no longer in the news and therefore there's yes. not that much interest? So it, it seems like companies have a lot of difficulty to actually tie the ESG agenda with the diversity and inclusion agenda. Right. So they think that's a North situation, whereas a and situations, at, at, at least it should be. So it takes me to the next point. Uh, I think that they have a lot of difficulty to think holistically in DNI. So uh, we in Brazil, I mean, in our institution, we tackle DNI. I mean, as uh, within the E and the S and the G. For example, when we're talking about environmental racism, so it means like, what are the populations who are struggling to have like sanitation or to have food? So most most of them are non-white populations. So we need to talk about environmental racism and the S part of it. So where are going? our investments, uh, our social investments, mostly for white-led uh, company, for white-led institutions, not for the indigenous or non-white uh, institutions. So we need to think about inclusion in the S frame. And the, the G, the governance, we also need to think about inclusion in the governance. So how are we treating, uh, for example, racism or sexism um, Gender issues in our in our system, and how are, how are how are we producing data, for example, and also. I think we are having a lot of difficulty to think uh, global and local, both. For example, uh, there is there, there are a lot of programs who tackle like who are who said they are a global. Um, they have a global commitment on inclusion, but they are more U.S. centered. Okay. So they don't reach Brazil. They don't reach other regions where there are black, indigenous, or non-white population. Okay. And that takes me to my last point: is like we need to move beyond the U.S. where we still have a lot of challenges, but we advanced a little bit more than other regions where we still need investments and we still need to, take, to talk a lot more about that. For example, we had a coalition, we have a coalition here as YGLs. Uh, we build, we build it like this agenda of hackathons and everyone is more than uh, invited to participate. And we are trying to tackle different issues in different parts of the world. My friend here is from Nepal. He also faced a lot of problems with caste issues. We have problems in Canada, but we also have a lot of opportunities, as right. we were saying, to tackle those issues uh, uh, in a global perspective, but also respecting the local language, the local context, and to waste less talents and less opportunities by tackling this issue global and locally. All right. Thank you so much for that. And he and she was talking about Pradeep Parier, my friend, another yes. fellow young global leader, yes. whose work with the caste-based discrimination in Nepal and around South Asia is incredible. His organization is called Dalit Lives Matter. Please check Very them important. out. Uh, Ms. Carter, the same question. Where do you see progress and what are still the remaining challenges in terms of advancing racial and ethnic equity? I am the great-granddaughter of a slave. And as a child, I marched with Dr. Martin Luther King. And thinking about where he is and where we are today, there is progress. But I'd say the first challenge is that it's not resilient enough. We advance and then we regress. And we often regress to hostility and backlash and violence. And then we have to regroup, and it has to be an event before we're ready to then create a new momentum. And the question is, how can we create the level of resilience, robustness, and at some point, similar to having a net zero, what is our global challenge and our global opportunity together? You know, often we can use technology at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, we call it swarming, swarming learning, where we can all share data insights and figure out how we can together maintain, sustain, and retain our momentum even during the backlash, even during the intensity of the hostility, because it often creates fear and anger. The second thing I'd say is one of the biggest challenges is, did you realize that in this year, $1.8 trillion here in America is the black consumer spending power? $1.8 trillion. And yet this particular demography is ignored and often underlooked. And if they're treated, they're treated badly in a lot of our commercial environments. We're talking about shareholder value, and yet we leave stranded assets. If you add African Americans, Asian Americans, Hispanics, Latinx, indigenous, dis people with disabilities, it is $5 trillion. 
And the question is, are we really interested in growth? Are we really interested in shareholder value? Then why are we stranding a lot of the assets? And the same thing with labor. We kept saying there's a labor shortage, but there isn't. And we have people that are being educated more every day that are of every race, gender, and economic uh, status. And even if in the African-American community there's an assumption that, if, oh, you don't have any money, we have found that we are the best consumers, we are more wily with apps, that we are innovators and early adopters, we are skewing younger and growing faster. Why wouldn't you want to incorporate us in every asset of what you're doing? Uh, it's incredible. I think there is progress. When you matched with Dr. K Dr. King as a child, a woman like your black woman would not be on the board of HP. And here you are right now. You are a groundbreaking um, attorney general as well in the early 90s when you're the first black attorney general of the state of? Indiana. Indiana. Yes. So there's progress, certainly. But would you say that as a society, have we made enough steps forward or have we also gone too far back? Well, we always celebrate too soon, and we, and we let go too soon. Yeah. So when I ran and won uh, the Attorney General, it was the year of the woman, and we had made it. And then we look today, and we're having the same conversations. <laughs> Did we make progress? Absolutely. Did we learn and grow in power? Absolutely. Many of the Attorneys Generals are in all kinds of high positions. But then the pipeline was not as robust. And so we have to think past, present, and future in terms of the challenges. On the opportunities, though, I've seen so many great opportunities where we can move to ownership. Another company that I am on the, the board, we have just signed a contract with 23 First Nations, wow. where we have given 11% of our pipeline for them to be able to handle whatever they need to do as equal owners. So we're learning how to use all of the financial consuming buying power, and then also creating ownership with whomever we are working with and for in our local communities. All right, I saw you nodding very vigorously, Ms. Williams, as she was talking, because you agree certainly on the progress, but I imagine also on the places where there's still gaps. Yeah, so I, I will say I was the amen corner to both of my <laughs> sisters. <laughs> um, so just a couple of things, um, and I want to share the perspective from my organization, United Way Worldwide. We um, are, have 1,100 local entities that serve in 37 countries. What makes us so unique is that my colleagues live in the communities that we serve. So we're the neighbors. We we understand what's happening. And, and that's where I, I feel like, I, let me just give you an example of a story of how we're showing up when it comes to moving things forward. Um, so there was this city um, called Haiti, named after Haiti, but they pronounced it Haiti. It's known as the Black Wall Street. Uh, the second one, this first one was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The second one is in the Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. Well, there was a point in, I think, the 60s or 70s, the city said, we're going to tear down Black Wall Street where there were black banks, black doctors, black stores, business people, and we're going to build a highway. So I met uh, a couple of months ago with the next generation of those black bank owners and store owners, and they are still grieving the loss of economic wealth. They are still living the trauma of having their world destroyed by a decision of a, of a government. But what United Way is doing is we're now facilitating conversations where we're empowering uh, and paying for the advocacy of these individuals. We are bringing government together to say now, you took this generational wealth away what do you owe this community? And facilitating the conversations to rebuild this community and what was lost. Uh, we're also bringing to light, there are so many black and brown people, again, in community creating solutions, but they don't get the funding. They don't get the notoriety. So what we did at United Way is said, we're gonna lift up all of the, the black and brown leaders of nonprofits and let the business community know, here's where the work is happening. Here's where you can make a quality investment. All of that to say that that gets to the heart, I think the root of some of these issues that we're seeing in the US. It's the lack of economic mobility, the lack of education, the lack of being able to have access to health care, And all of these get to the root cause of systemic issues, which, which 
uh, basically undermine uh, or well undermine racial ethnic uh, ethnic groups G gender as well but we're here to talk about race so what's the opportunity that we have one again we have to maintain the level of we're going to stay at this we're going to keep going we're going to set metrics we're going to hold companies we're going to hold governments we're going to hold everyone accountable to these metrics we're going to create programs after we do the self assessment of where we are to say what are we going to do to create that pipeline? What are we going to do to elevate people, to train them up, to give them the opportunity? That's what this is about. And I'll just say one other thing that um, I, I, I said, made this statement and, and someone on social media attacked me um, because I made it a couple of days ago here, but I'm gonna say it again. So bring <laughs> it on, whoever you are. <laughs> That's the energy we're here for. <laughs> so, so, so what I said was that a lot of our systems, and it doesn't matter what country you're in, they were based on and created on bad values. And they were created, systems created for a particular population and created to exclude other people. So what do I say about that? Why don't we blow up those systems? <clears throat> and do something different. And I, and I got into it back and forth with one of my panelists, and I said, yeah, that sounds radical. It makes people who are leading these systems, makes their skin crawl. However, what I'm trying to say is this, that we need, you could call it a new playbook, a new table, but equity is what we're talking about. So I'll stop, because I could go on and on. <laughs> I wonder, that's not controversial at all. The only person who would find an issue with that statement is because they're invested in, or they benefit from that exclusion of other people, right? Mm -hmm. So it should not be something that's controversial, at least not in my books. Well, I was called a left-wing uh, something something. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Mr. Freakley, your chance again. Progress, right. opportunities, or rather where you still see some work to be done. Great. Uh, well, you, the audience might think, what's this middle-aged white guy doing? <laughs> <laughs> Sitting on this we were all thinking it, so what are you doing here exactly? Um, we need a diversity. Yeah, you need a diversity. There you go. <laughs> Our diversity panelist, please. <laughs> diversity quota. I have a personal yeah. perspective. I have a business perspective. I'm going to talk mostly about the business. But okay. personally, I, I have two uh, African-American children, so I have a frontline seat on a number of these issues. But let me just talk about my business life. I run an organization in 14 countries, over 3,000 people. And what we realize is that having diversity in our firm in all ways, but particularly ways that brings the very best talent from all constituencies into our firm, is going to be crazy. Why wouldn't we bring the best talent in? And then we realized, of course, that just espousing a business value in and of itself isn't particularly compelling, unless it's a value of the organization, unless it's something that we own as a value, actually not a lot happens. And so uh, inclusion, diversity, equity is a the value of our organization and we seek to think about the practical ways that we can create that environment so we do welcome and include uh, and give uh, those people that we do include a sense of belonging in our firm. So to your question Larry, how, other than the aspiration, how do we make it happen and how do we capture it? Well, the only way that it happens is, and that's why I always like to say inclusion comes before diversity, unless one has an inclusive environment, I mean diversity is simply not going to happen, so it starts with inclusion. You know, as somebody said to me uh, recently, um, diversity um, is a reality, inclusion is a choice. So we start with that choice. Now, how do uh, middle aged white people like me? play a part in making that happen well, you start by being an ally. How are you an ally to all constituencies mm -hmm. to make them feel that they belong in this environment? How are you an advocate when that is required to make sure that not just that you um, passively accept and support, but that you advocate for the right things, and where necessary, how everybody is an activist to make that happen. And so we make it very clear that these things are not just a value of the firm, they're actually in, um, encased in people's objectives. They're measured to make sure that we have our fingers on the critical pulses of whether we continue to be inclusive. And then we do look at the output of those strategies to make sure we're becoming increasingly diverse, that we are welcoming more and more uh, uh, colleagues with, from ethnic minorities. And, by the way, you know, people that are diverse in other respects, to make sure we have the most vibrant, the most inclusive environment in which people feel they can belong.
Can I just ask yes, a question? Yes, yes, ma'am. I know you're the moderator, but it just, it, 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 the question I want to ask you then, what about the employees that don't want this, that don't want to be measured, that think you as a leader are going overboard? Well, I have pretty straight conversations with people that will have me that conversation with me directly, and I say, this may just not be the place for you. Because let me be clear, this is where we're going. This is absolute... This is absolutely non-negotiable, and if that's not for you, the, the, the world is a big place. I like that. <laughs> so I think you would agree with the, what Angela said, that systems that were built to exclude certain people need to be torn down. Right. Quickly. Look at that. I know. Uh, is your communications person here? <laughs> <laughs> because they would have, uh, have other thoughts about that. Luan, I wanted to pick up on something you said about a lot of these DEI initiatives tend to be very US-centric, or at least yes. European-centric. And you, coming from Brazil, who's been doing this work for a long time, I wonder what kind of challenges you face and how you're overcoming them. Yeah, I would say even more US centered than European centered because yeah. in Europe we observe that there are a lot of um, a lot of DNI but most focused on gender issues yeah. uh, but this gender is a lot has a lot of difficulty to be intersectional for example and especially they reach uh, white women, but not the whole bunch of women who are in this plural group. So that's a he real change here, challenge here in Europe, I think. And also here in Europe, we have the challenge of having disaggregated data. For example, in France, we do not collect data uh, for race and ethnicity. So I think that's a huge challenge. And I think we have an opportunity, uh, I mean, not only in Brazil, but also here in Europe, uh, Latin America as a whole, to build a global agenda on inclusion in, in the labor market, an agenda that will include, for example, uh, presidents from the country, sea levels, civil society, to all together, because I couldn't see this agenda uh, put it uh, in on, on place yet, just in silos. Like there is this um, conference in the United States or Colombia or Brazil, but not all together as we have like the, for, the World Economic Forum. So I think that's our issue in Brazil. I mean, we have a very particular reality because we are the only uh, country uh, in Latin America who speaks Portuguese, and you know we have we, we have to deal with our racial. Uh, myth, uh, we have a, a racial democracy myth there where uh, if you go to Brazil people will say oh there, there, oh there is only like poor people but all people everyone is mixed which is which is not true we have a hierarchy in this mixture so the, the darker you are the less opportunities you get the lower down the hierarchy uh, yeah you are. yeah so it, it means that we kind of look like the the, uh, the reality in Nepal for example where the caste system play a great role there racism plays a real a huge role in Brazil. And in Brazil, for example, we are the biggest African diaspora in the world. So we have more than 110 million black and indigenous people, but we only get like 5% of the leadership roles. But when uh, we go to you company, companies based on you, the US, they say, oh, you, ha you know, you have a lot to do here in the US. We cannot invest that much in Brazil. Right. So I think we need still to bridge, to, to, to build g bridges between our countries and to make this agenda uh, work in a global scale. So I think this is the big challenge here. I like what you said earlier about the fact that the DEI agenda and ESG do not have to be separate because these are deeply interlinked. Yeah, that would be ideal. <laughs> and I think the one thing that I'm going to take from what Luana said is that George Floyd obviously um, got the whole world to pay attention, but in Brazil, there's a George Floyd killed every 23 minutes, every according 23 to the minutes, Amnesty. According to Amnesty International, that is shocking. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to follow up here um, with Angela and Pamela about when we were in the height of 2020 and the pandemic and every company was big, making a big announcement and obviously that commitment sometimes appears to have faltered and this is no longer a major issue in the same way it was in two years ago and do you feel, how do you make sure at um, Hewlett Packard for instance that you are sticking to those commitments and you're not off track? The term unconditional and unflinching is the way in which our leadership attacks and is passionate and committed to uh, DEI and ESG. And the fact that it's disclosed in our uh, publications, those terms, unconditional. Um, we also have set the tone at the top in terms of strategy. Hewlett Packard is in 170 countries. We have over 250,000 channel partners. 
Um, and so and we have 60,000 employees, so the opportunity to have an influence and an impact globally is huge. And we haven't uh, shrunk, shrunk from that responsibility at all. Um, I'm very proud, actually, of the fact that right after George Floyd, the senior executive team and some members of the board went on a listening tour throughout the uh, 170 countries, not assuming that they already knew what the answer to the problems were, and find out what's happening in our environment, in our culture, and we set out our core values and our culture and our talent, uh, we, we feel very strongly about our commitment to people and human resources. But that doesn't mean that we're perfect. And so the opening uh, act was to go and do this listening tour. And we learned. And then from there, we began to develop the work plans. And from there, we were able to put metrics in place. Because you have to be accountable. And that's been said a couple yes. of times already. And then if you falter, you falter. And it's public. We disclose all of our representation uh, statistics. We let people know where we are with pay equity around the world. And we are one-to-one. -one. We've been working on that a lot. Um, in terms of uh, working where you live, we have, uh, for women, um, six-month maternity leave, uh, paid, uh, and Including paternity. Including the U.S.? U.S., U.K., India, any place that we have, and in the countries that we are, if they have more, then we permit that, but it's paid. And that, yes, in the U.S. as well. Because so, the U.S. is a terrible uh, yes. paid leave policy. And so there is an unflinching commitment um, to making certain that we're doing the right thing in terms of training, in terms of development. But I like what you said. A lot of it is local and regional. And we really cannot be chauvinistic in terms of our cultural view writ large in terms of countries. And so we are humble in this process. We're learning a lot. We're trying to lead. And we'd like to be able to collaborate more with other technology companies, because that's going to be absolutely essential. Um, Simon, you've worked extensively across both the U.S. and in Europe, and obviously approaches mm -hmm. to these issues differ sometimes quite starkly in right. those two different geographies. What are some interesting takeaways you can share with us? So one of the things I've learned, having worked a lot in Europe and the U.K. Um, and the UK specifically in the States, is that many of the issues are the same, but the narratives that surround them are different. And so the narrative, for instance, if we just take the, the black community, for instance, the narrative uh, in the UK is largely around the Windrush generation, people that were brought in from the West Indies, uh, you know, uh, for, for economic reasons to help support infrastructure and utilities and transport. Whereas the narrative in the US, of course, is for the black community, uh, African-American community is largely anchored in slavery. And so these are two very different narratives. That that being said, the issues that we're dealing with in both geographies are very similar. And so what I've learned in this is I've tried to learn from others and just understand the complexity and significance is that the key is to be intentional, is it's really important to be intentional about what we want to do, what we stand for as a firm, our values, what we want to manifest in terms of the business that we, we hope to be and we're trying to be, and be intentional about the things, the specific things that include and support and develop all people, and listen and understand uh, with ethnic minorities what is the best way to support them so that we can all be our best. So I would say, Larry, the key is different narratives, similar issue, but the key is for us to be intentional. Speaking on the same issue of accountability, uh, Ms. Williams, what more do you think can be done to make sure there's robust accountability on advancing racial and ethnic equity in organizations around the world? So I, I like what WEF has done by, one, launching this toolkit, which um, it gives companies a way in which to start looking at themselves um, points to a pathway. Um, secondly, I, I, I appreciate but also am disappointed that we're still having these types of conversations. I think it's important, like Hewlett Packard is doing, and it's good to hear that you all report your numbers and are, are, are bold about it, and continuing to put pressure on companies um, from the inside, meaning employees, and externally from others that are partnering or working with um, businesses or companies to say, what are you doing different? 
And I will just segue and, and, and say that my uh, board, the United Way Worldwide Board, um, after George Floyd, issued a, a statement that said, a racial equity statement, that they asked all of our 1,100 local United Ways to adopt. Now, I will tell you, we're in 37 countries. In the US, again, as it relates to the narrative, we understand um, historically what that would mean. But uh, in, on other continents, like Europe and others, they're saying, well, we don't necessarily think this applies. Because what went along with that was we asked that boards, our local boards, be, um, go through a training on racial equity once a year. So uh, we built out a whole toolkit and everything else. So again, similar to WEF, we were moving and are moving in a direction, but I will just say, we still get the pushback um, where I received calls from, um, in the US even, well, our community, we don't have any racial issues. <laughs> okay, well you have some equity issues, at least somewhere. Um, but there, there's just a lot that we have to do, um, and I think the, the transparency and the visibility and shedding a light on it is important. The accountability, the public accountability is important. It makes people uncomfortable. It makes leaders uncomfortable. But it's like being um, an alcoholic. The first step to recovery is what? Admitting, right. And so we need to take that first step in recovery. And I'm not sure that a lot of people have done that or a lot of entities have done that still. Right. One thing in terms of uh, tying your performance to compensation. So I'm, yes. I'm the chair of the comp HR and Compensation Board, and it is required of our senior executives through their MBOs that if they don't meet the variety of targets that we've set in DEI, ESG, they get paid less. So right. they've, got, they've got a skin in the game, no fooling, and, um, and that matters. And so they take it seriously, we take it seriously, and we're unflinching about it as well. If you don't like that kind of culture and expectation, then maybe you should go somewhere else. But with that said, our voice of the employee surveys, it's in the 80% in terms of great place to work, and, and our brand is you know, even higher. So that, and we're retaining people, so we're also measuring in a way to make certain that, we're, that what we're, we think is the proper approach is actually working. And then if we do fall flat, we will be the first to publicly acknowledge that and we'll redouble our efforts and keep going forward, but we'll be very aggressive about it. That's fantastic. All right, fantastic. I wonder if mandating diversity awareness training or any sort of employee company-wide training on these issues helps. Does it work? Do people re um, reject it? Any insights on that? I think you? you just have to meet people where they are. I think there are multiple ways in which to change culture. And just like you just said, it could be tying to compensation or setting metrics and having the conversations. But I think all of it is important. And then, you know, most important I found is that it comes with understanding each other, understanding our lived experiences, and actually fostering conversations small group conversations. Let me tell you why I believe the way I believe. Let me tell you about my experience. And when you start sharing your own personal stories, the person across from you says, oh, I didn't realize that's how you have to live. Um, and, and, or how, that's how the, what your experience is with law enforcement, or this is your experiences when you go to a doctor, or this is your experience when uh, in school. So conversation, one-on-one -on -one sharing of stories, I think is also extremely important. Yeah, I would like to add on what Mrs. Williams was saying. Yes, Luana. Just because, I mean, I, we do a lot of trainings in companies. We, we have our Yes to Racial Quality CEO there in Brazil. And what we realize is that most of the people who are in power positions in Brazil, I mean, especially before George Floyd, they would deny there was a racial issue in Brazil, exactly as we were saying. Just head in the sand, this does not exist. Yeah, that doesn't exist here. So they would keep saying that. But once they were trained and they were uh, basically more conscious about, oh, I don't have like black peers, I don't have like a black board mm -hmm. or indigenous people here, they would say, oh, we need to do something. So train the training part is still very important because we're still in a very 
basic um, error, uh, unfortunately. But uh, I would I would add also that it's an end situation. Obviously, we need training, but we also need uh, a, a goals tied to compensation so people can move forward, even if you don't love this, because you, you just because you, you want to earn more money, and that's okay. I mean, it's it's just a matter. It it, it it doesn't matter if you like or don't like racial justice or ESG. Just do it because that's your work. So we are trying to keep this as a, as a best practice, but it's still we need to have a group like that putting pressure. Right. So companies, governments uh, put that in the plane, the, their plane, because it's it, it it doesn't happen like automatically. Can I just say one thing? We tend to have this conversation as is as if it's a zero sum game. Like there's just one pie, and here's this slice, this slice, and if if I get a slice, that I'm taking something from you and it's not that's not the case and and so we have to shift mindsets that we're in this together um, and so if my purchasing power is not valued it's going to affect you as a company it's going to affect the economy so we need to shift our mindset and when we're talking about DE and I and it's not this one-off thing it's not about I lose power and I have to transfer it to you that is a brilliant takeaway. Racial equity, ethnic equity is not pie. Giving that to somebody else does not reduce your own share of it. We'll take that away. Um, we want to get some questions from the audience. In terms of, OK, whoever gets a mic first. Fine, Sangu, you're right in front of me. It's his birthday. My birthday. It's his birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> um, first of all, this is an amazing panel. Can we give another round of applause? This is really, really, really exciting. Thank you all. Um, so I have uh, two quick questions. The first is, uh, we released, um, at Harvard, we released the Legacy of Slavery report in which we committed $100 million. But if you dig into the, if you look into the fine print, there's, it's interesting how when it comes to, you know, reparative justice, we're comfortable talking about, oh, we're investing in programs, we're investing in institutions, we're investing in this. No one wants to talk about actual reparations to the people who are harmed. They say, it's too complicated. How do we calculate? Yet all these countries paid off their slave owners. Mm -hmm. In fact, Britain just finished paying it off recently. Right. right? So why? I like, let's dig into this issue. Why is it that for the people like uh, uh, um, um, uh, Madame Carter, who you can do, you can do the work. Right. I mean, Skip Gates has been going all over the place testing people and finding their lineage. It, we know we have the technology to figure it out. So why is it that when it comes to this particular issue of reparative justice, we are always shying away from that? Second question: We spoke a lot about racial um, equity, but we, we didn't touch a lot on ethnic equity, and that's something that you know, um, coming from Ghana. I come from the northern part of Ghana. When the British came, they divided us. The south was educated, the north was not educated. In fact, the first person from my part of the country, the north, who got a university degree was in 1963 at Monalhasa Bazamba. So whereas from the south, they've been educated for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Yet because we all look alike, no one talks about it. And you see these sorts of inequalities pervade and persist. What can we do and what lessons can we take from the fight in racial equity to ensure that we're also leveling the playing field for ethnic equity? The ethnic, I, I want to take another question as well so we can take them together. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you very much. I have two questions, but I'll keep them very brief. Yes. And thank you very much to the panel because it's been a phenomenal conversation. And I really do hope if WEF is listening, this needs to be on the main plenary next year because this really needs to have a wider global engagement. But first, I'd like to ask a question from the America's perspective. And then, Larry, if I may, I'd like to ask you a question similar to also East African from the African perspective or just APAC, other regions that were similarly affected by the colonial legacies where we see these racial constructs um, insidiously affecting wealth distribution. But when you were talking about if there's no place for you here if you're not aligned with our goals. What concerns me after George Floyd is as much as we've seen mobilization, we've also seen mobilization on the other side, 
polarization, right? Critical race theory was a way that certain groups were able to mobilize the voters in order to see, see change in political um, representation. And that concerns me because when you're talking about we are trying to attract the best and brightest talent, yes, talent is equally distributed across all groups. Right. Right. But they don't have equal opportunities to develop that talent, so yeah. the educational system <clears throat> is important. Right. And if you remove this type of education from there, then what next generation are you looking at? It sets us back mm -hmm. in terms of, I'm thinking, the historic injustices we're trying to incrementally correct. So I'm concerned about that in your views. And Larry, if you've been asking I'm a questions. panelist. I can't answer okay. questions. <laughs> okay. you can, you I can just share some insights. Yes, real quick, though. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So can I have a crack at the first of your two? Go for it. Go for it, yes. Um, so, so it's a great question, thank you. And of course, what in, in my own experience as we've lived through this is if the things that we're doing are not manifesting the outcomes that we want, then we're mad just to carry on doing those things. So we have to try different things all the time. I'll give you an example. So in, in, our, in our value to manifest the best talent, particularly with, um, with all types of diversity in mind, if we keep on recruiting from the same graduate colleges and we can't recruit enough diversity, why the heck are we only recruiting there? We need yeah. to recruit in different places. So we took a very deliberate decision. Okay, brilliant people come out of Harvard and Princeton and Wharton and Penn, great, but we're not getting enough of the talent that we want in the broadest sense. Let's start looking in different places. So we now very deliberately look in a much broader range of places. Now people have to be just as bright and prepared to work just as hard and have to hold our values and be absolutely as committed to the future we're trying to create. But the places we used to look simply weren't facilitating the outcomes that we wanted. So we had to change the way that we looked at it. I'm just saying political types seems to generally set back. The events uh, we were making in terms of... I, I want to be able to move this conversation to get everybody's voice. In the few minutes we have left, I apologize. Uh, do you want to have a crack at reparative justice and why reparations is um, a complicated question that uh, is not quite easy to wrestle with? Angela? I go back to the last point I just made because people feel like if you're going to make reparations to somebody for something that happened, you know, 100 years ago, you're going to be taking it from me today. And I don't want to give up what's mine. All right, and, yeah. and Pamela. Well, I think that if you're thinking about what a next step would be is going through reconciliation. You know, they did that in uh, South Africa because I think we have to acknowledge where we were in our past. And because, you know, as you know, justice develops along a line of tr toward trust and confidence. And you can't have that until you can acknowledge where we've been together. And, you know, it's, it's quite difficult if you come from a slave heritage and you come from a free heritage. And so I think reconciliation is, is an issue. And then when you're talking about criminal justice, who's the justice for anyway? And so I think we have to be thoughtful. We don't have reparative justice in our system today. So I mean, we're, we still have a punitive justice system. Right. So I mean, I, I think that the questions are from your generation and younger generations are going to be, I think, demanding some more accountability to our past in order for us, because past is prologue. Right. So so I think you're going to hear a lot more about it, but I think there are a whole host of steps prior to actually reaching it so that we can be resilient, it can be sustainable and robust in terms of our equity journey. Luana, you wanted to jump in here. Yes, about the reparation thing. I think uh, in Brazil, we just don't have enough people, especially black and indigenous people in power, in power roles in politics to actually build a plan or where we can do a reparation there. Because that's a huge topic, but we cannot pass the laws to make it happen. So we need to be more present in parliament so we can maybe do a reparation plan there because we need it. And about concerning uh, ethnicity, I, I really think myself really reflected in your reality in Ghana because, for example, black people from southeast in Brazil, they got more access than the black people from uh, northeast. And the same thing with the indigenous people. Some some people like uh, the Tupinambas, the, uh, the different, different people within the indigenous community, they may get somehow some more access. So we do have a lot of ethnical problems in Brazil. And I think it takes like more intentionality. So when we build a, 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 an action plan for a company, for example, 
we say to them to hire people from not only black people from Southeast, but also from the Northeast. So that's a way to be more intentional and, and try to actually be more uh, inclusive, not only with the black people uh, in the places where they are used to hire, but also in the other regions and from other ethnicities they are not used to. So. Yeah. And I think that is a, 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 something that's similar in many African contexts where we have tribes or ethnicities or different communities and um, companies, even big multinationals that operate in the continent don't track that sort of ethnicity um, numbers. Part of it is for political reasons, it's likely to be controversial, and yet you can often see the sentiment that people feel they're not represented in the leadership of some of these um, huge organizations, yet there is no way to actively consciously make an effort or make a point that, no, you seem to have all the people from just the north of the country and nowhere else, and that's not representative of the nation or the society that we live in. So a lot of work to be done there. We only have 30 seconds left. If somebody has a burning final point before we wrap it up. I do. Just just really quick. We were talking here about the net zero, uh, obviously, commitment that our countries need to make. I, I was also wondering if we can do like a waste zero talents commitment. Mm. So we could not waste uh, more talents yes. and right. opportunities anymore, yes. which is also as important as the net zero, because if we waste less talents, we'll be probably reaching the net zero point uh, uh, quicker. So yeah, Absolutely. it would be great. Thank you, Luana. And that is a great place to bring this conversation to a close. I think we, two takeaways, equity is not pie. <laughs> and two, there's need for a lot more accountability on these matters. Please give a big round of applause to my panel. You've been fantastic. Thanks a lot. Well done.